Well, I hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving. I, uh, I'm glad I'm here. I came to church so I don't have to work anymore. I have too many things to do. My wife had a big list. I had a big list. And so I came to work to rest a little bit. So thank you for being here today. Someday, 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 someday I'm going to give thanks to God. I'll give him thanks. I'll, someday I'll remember the good things he's done in my life. I'll remember the blessings he's given me, the family and friends he's brought into my world, the price that Jesus Christ paid to offer eternal life to me. Someday it's going to happen. Someday I'm going to give him the full thanks he deserves. Now, no matter how tough life can get, I can say with confidence that we all have so much to give thanks to God for today. Don't we? Yeah. Don't we? I mean, think about it. The people that God has brought into your life. Yes, even that crazy Uncle Eddie. The, the things that God has given us. The opportunities we have in America. And most importantly, that God is ever available. Thanking God that he's ever available, that he's in control, that he's good, and that he's full of grace. We all, from time to time, need a shift in perspective from doom and gloom to seeing life with a vital, godly, Christian optimism. Would you agree with that? Here, Because here's what I found. I, I find it in my life, and maybe it's true in your life. I find that we tend to count our blessings with our fingers, and we count our problems with a calculator. And we need some perspective. You know whose perspective we need? The perspective of Snoopy. Snoopy, absolutely. You know the Peanuts and Charlie Brown. How many know that? Am I dating myself? Am I too old? You, you probably know that. It's still on. Snoopy is uh, out for Thanksgiving, and uh, he's getting dog food for his dinner on Thanksgiving Day. He's fully aware that everybody inside is enjoying an incredible turkey meal, and he wishes he could eat it, but instead he gets dog food like he does every day. So he says, how about that? Everyone's eating turkey today? And just because I'm a dog, I have to get stuck with dog food. Then you know how the cartoon works. He trots away and positions himself where? On top of his doghouse. And he concludes this. He goes, of course, it could have been worse. I could have been born a turkey. <laughs> so, how do, so how do we make this shift from thanklessness to thanksgiving? Thanklessness to thanksgiving. By the way, there are three stages that we can all engage in when it comes to thanks. First, we can be thankless. Thanklessness. How many know there's a lot of thanklessness in our world? You help people, they, they're thankless. So there's first level is thanklessness. The second level is where a lot of people stop, but it's not enough. It sounds good, and that's this. It's thankfulness. We go, well, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And so we go, well, that, that's the goal. The goal is to be thankful. Nope, there's something even better. Thanklessness is obviously bad. Thankfulness is nice. It's in the right direction, but it's not. There's a third level, even deeper than thankfulness, and it's what? Thanksgiving. What's there between thankfulness and thanksgiving? Thankfulness is an inner attitude that's preserved in your own thoughts. Thanksgiving is an outer expression communicated to the one you are giving thanks to. You see the difference between thankfulness and thanksgiving? Thankfulness is the, the foundation for thanksgiving, but thankfulness in and of itself isn't enough. And a lot of people are like, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. Well, cool. Are you giving thanks to somebody? Now, God deserves our thanksgiving, not just our thankfulness. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we look at someday I'll give thanks. So take out your notes and open to 1 Chronicles 16. First of all, some of you don't even believe there's a 1 Chronicles 16 in the Bible. Second, if you're a newer person to, to the Bible or Christianity, you're not yet a Christian, you have a Bible, or you're a young Christian, when you open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 16, you may hear a crunching sound. That's called your binding, because it doesn't open there. Not many people talk from 1 Chronicles 16. And uh, so that's what I want to talk to you about. Now, we have a great history of giving thanks to God. And if we love God, we're called to recognize the need to give thanks to him. Why give thanks to God? The top of your notes, 1 Chronicles 16, 34, King David tells us, he says this, verse 34, give thanks to the Lord. Why? 
for he is good. No matter how bad life gets, God's good. No matter how bad it gets, God is good. So I want to give you four reasons this morning to give thanks to God every day of your life, every moment of your life. And I'll also give you four phrases to help you practically give thanks instead of just being thankful. Thankful is okay. Giving thanks is the objective of life. And then I'll throw in a little history lesson in between. So let me give you reasons to give thanks to God. Let me give you a little food for thought. I worked all week on that line. Food <laughs> for thought. How many ate too much on Thursday? How many ate too much on Friday? <laughs> I won't ask you about Saturday. <laughs> Let me give you a little background. Israel had a very special golden chest called the Ark of the Covenant that was built during the time of Moses some 1,400 years before the time of Christ, about 1,400 plus B.C. The Ark of of the covenant. It was called the Ark of the Covenant because the cherubim, the angels on top, served as a protection or an ark. And covenant simply means, not technically, you probably could poke a hole in it, but just for, for people who are maybe not familiar with what's between a covenant and a contract, a covenant is a spiritual contract. Okay? I mean, that's simplistic. It may not be a, a Webster definition, but a, a, a covenant is a spiritual contract. And the Ark of the Covenant was God's Ark protecting Israel and his covenant that he would never, ever break his protective care over Israel. There are two kinds of covenants in the Old Testament. One's called a conditional covenant and the other's called an unconditional covenant. A conditional covenant would be the covenant God made with Moses. Like the covenant God made with Moses, the Ten Commandments and such, or if you um, saw that movie with Mel Brooks where he said, the 15, the Ten Commandments. No, there was, it was ten all along. That, that covenant that God made with Moses was temporary. It's called conditional. It's no longer in effect today. But there are other covenants, like the one God made with Abraham, that are unconditional. And the Ark of the Covenant is an unconditional covenant with us. It started with Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham that he will bless Israel, and God's not rescinded that. He will bless the nation of Israel. But the Bible says something cool. It says, through Israel, all the other nations will be blessed. So we are all blessed because of the blessing that God bestowed upon Israel through this unconditional spiritual contract, a covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And so that's what the ark represented. It was not only symbolic of God's covenant with Israel, it was symbolic of the presence of God. The covenant was not the presence of God. Whenever Israel confused that, God would correct them. He said, I don't dwell in covenants, I don't dwell in tabernacles, I don't dwell in tents, I don't dwell in buildings. But it was a symbol, a reminder of the presence of God. It was to be handled with special care. If you touched it inappropriately, you got nucleated to a crisp. Uh, just before, earlier, in before First Chronicles 16, I forget where it is, um, they're carrying the ark back from um, a certain place in Israel. They're going to bring it to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem. And um, the, the ark began to slip, and somebody touched it to grab it, and he died. Because the ark represented the holiness of God, and you don't trample on the holiness of God. I know tons of Christians in America do. They do whatever they want. They sin how they want, come to church, play church, and they trample on the holiness of God. I understand that. I, that's, that's American Christianity, sadly. I understand that. But God takes his holiness so seriously that this man died. And the Bible says David was ticked at God, and he wouldn't bring it to Jerusalem. Now, that eventually changed. But here's the point. If you touched it, Man, you, you were playing with the holiness of God, and you don't want to do that. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were three things to symbolize three different dimensions of the greatness of God. First was a jar of manna. Second was Aaron's rod that, that budded. And then third was the tablets or the Ten Commandments. The jar of manna was that, that jar that kept the bread in it uh, that God miraculously let fall from the sky. The word manna in Hebrew, it literally translates, what is it? Because that's what happened. They, they didn't know what it was about, and God provided food, and there was this stuff all over the ground, and they said, what is it? And that's what they call it. So there was a jar of what is it? 
in, in the covenant. And the whole goal was to say, God provides your food. He's your sustainer. The second thing was Aaron's rod, which would bud. It was, rods don't bud. And what was the purpose of that? It was to show the miracle working power of God. Again, all of these pertain to Israel's exodus from Egypt into eventually the promised land over that 40 year wilderness uh, wanderings. And that uh, reminded them that God can do miracles. God provided miracles on your exit from Egypt. He provided miracles along the way. He's still doing miracles for us today. And then third was the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments, which reminded us that God is the moral authority. He's true north. He's the only one that knows truth, and we rely on him for the truth. So the Ark of the Covenant had these three great reminders. It had been devalued in the time of Saul, the king before Israel, the, the background of that the Israelites said, hey, we want a king like all the other nations. And, and Samuel, the prophet, was very uh, hurt by this. He sought God, and God said, let them, let them have what they want. It's going to fail. Let them have what they want. So they got a king. And just like God predicted, they, got, they were a theocracy, that is, God was their king. And that was ultimately, Samuel felt rejected. God said, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, the prophet. They're rejecting me, God. And Saul had m m glimmers of positive things, but by and large, he was a mess. It was a catastrophe. God's spirit wasn't upon him toward the end of his reign. And the Ark of the Covenant was just somewhere else, this place. And it was a, it was a source of blessing. Because David wanted to call it back. And when it, he began to bring it back and one of his friends touched it and died, he was hurt. So he left it at a man's house. And that man's life was blessed. Wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, there was blessing of God. If you were God's people and you had the Ark of the Covenant, east, me, me, me. They just, just got blessed. Now, if you were the wrong people, like the classic enemy, the Philistines, and you had the Ark of the Covenant, you got tumors, like, like what y'all did to me a couple weeks ago when Pastor Corey was up here. It was supposed to be napkins, and y'all looked like, like some Old Testament boils were up on me. Uh, I think you could have put like a, you know, a napkin, big old, uh, anyway. So it was like that. So eventually, David got the Ark, and he brought it back to Jerusalem, the capital city, Jaru Shalom, city of peace. I was at, it was originally called the city of David before it was called Jerusalem. And uh, I, I, when I went to Israel in um, January of 2014, I saw the city of David. There's still ruins that show where, likely where David lived. It's, oh, it was just fantastic. So David calls for the ark to be brought back as Israel's second king after Saul. And in this account, we see Four ways he gives thanks to God. By the way, it's all part of his inauguration ceremony. David is um, anointed as king, but now there's this inauguration ceremony. As part of it, he brings the ark back to the city. And then he tells a psalm, which is kind of unusual in, in um, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, those six books, first and second of each, because they're more narrative. But he drops a psalm in there, and we get four things. Are you ready? You want to give thanks to God? You want to... Give, not just be thankful, certainly not be thankless. Here's four things. comes from the psalm. First, give thanks for the greatness of God's character. David begins this Thanksgiving psalm with verses 8 to 11. He says this, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his miracles. Exalt in his holy name. O oh, worshipers of the Lord, rejoice Search for the Lord and for his strength and keep on searching. Why do we keep on searching? Because God's infinite, inexhaustible, and you could never know enough about God, never appreciate, never understand the depth of God. Now in this, uh, those verses of the psalm, the opening verses, David gives five ways in which he thanks God for who he is. First, his greatness. That is his character. Second thing he says, his praises. That he's worthy. You know, praises belong to somebody who is worthy. And the greatness of God's character shows that he's worthy. Third, for his miracles. That God does miracles to demonstrate concern for us in our time of need. And then fourth, it says, for his exalt in his holy name. That is his reputation. We're going to begin a series. Next week, we're going to wrap up the Someday series. The week after that, we're going to do a, a five-week series that will take us through Christmas. By the way, on Christmas, we're having services at 9 and 11 and 6 p.m. The 9 and 11 will be one kind of service, identical like these two. But the 6 p.m. will be another unique service. And so we're going to talk about the names of, of um, Christ in Isaiah 9, 6. And, and, and we're going to learn the greatness of Christ through his name. What's in a name? Everything. Your reputation. Your name. 
And then the fifth thing is his strength, that God is powerful. Giving thanks always starts with who God is, not what he does for us. Always give thanks for who God is more than what he does for us. Of course you give thanks for what he does for us, but what he does for us only comes from who he is. If he isn't who he is, he can't do what he does. You know, when you get candy, do you, are you thankful for the candy or are you thankful when you're a little kid? Are you thankful for the giver? Hopefully the giver. And that's the thing. We want to be thankful. Hopefully. Hopefully. It's so easy to forget. And we wonder why. Oh, I don't know. There's not a lot to give thanks to God for. That's silly. Now imagine how things could be if, if God were not who he is. I mean, think about it. God could be evil, but he's good. God could be impotent. This is the deist version. Benjamin Franklin believed in this. Some of our forefathers believed in this, that, that God was a deist. It was like the, in the old-fashioned days, um, before there was like all the phones and everything, there'd be a, this thing called an alarm clock. <laughs> and some of them were mechanical. You'd like wind them up. You just wind it up, and then it would just run, and then it would stop at some point. Some people, the deists believe that God was like an alarm clock. He just wound up the earth and let it go, and he, he just couldn't do anything about it. He was impotent. He was not strong enough. But, but thank God that's not true. God's all-powerful. He could have been helpless, but instead God is sovereign and in control. He could have been disinterested in us for all of our sin. He could have said, get out of here. I'm giving you chance after chance. And your sin keeps messing up, and I'm tired of it. But yet he's willing to reach out to us in love through grace, through his son, Jesus Christ. So many things to give thanks to God for. Yes. You know, in 1777, while on route to Valley Forge, you see this very famous picture appearing um, behind me here. Uh, George Washington and his army stopped in freezing weather to observe informally the very first Thanksgiving of the new United States of America. 1777, what's that? One year after our Declaration of Independence. The first Thanksgiving proclamation by President Washington was October 14, 1789. In 1777, George Washington had quote unquote, quote unquote, very little to give thanks to God for. His army was freezing cold, ill-equipped. Some army men didn't have boots. They were freezing, it was bitter cold, and they had to fend off the powerful army of Great Britain, but he found a way to give thanks. The first Thanksgiving Day proclamation was written by George Washington on October 14, 1789. He noted that the day was, quote, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be thankful for his benefits, and to humbly implore, implore his protection and favor. George Washington proclaimed that day to be, quote, devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious capital B being who is the benef uh, beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. That we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks, giving thanks, if you will, for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation. So the first thing we want to do is give thanks to God for who he is, like George Washington, like we learn in history. So for each one of these, I want to give you a phrase, because I want to give you something to say. How do I give thanks for this first thing? Here's a suggested statement, so you can write this down in your notes. Be able to say this, only God is this good. Only God is this good. Here's the second thing I get from this psalm of David during his inauguration and the restoration of the Ark of the Covenant back to the city. Give thanks for the faithfulness of God's word, the Bible. David continues, he is the Lord our God. His rule is seen throughout the land. He always, I have that circle in my notes, he always stands by his covenant, the commitment he made to a thousand generations. See, this is the eternal covenant. David reminds the people that, he'll rule, that he will rule faithfully. And never break his covenant, his spiritual contract, his agreement, but always keep his word. Now think about how often you and I let people down. Increasingly, as I get older, 
I realize when I say something, I have to do it. I, I've always tried to take it seriously, but I, if I say I'm going to pray for you, I'm asking you to write it down or something because I don't want to say I'm going to pray for you and then not do it. I feel like I've betrayed you, and I feel like I've betrayed my word. And think about how often you and I let other people down. We fail to live right. We don't give God the time he deserves. We don't love him like we should. We don't love people like we should. By the way, that'll be our conclusion next week. Someday I'll love people more. And yet God remains faithful. That's something to give thanks to God for. And God's faithfulness is a huge reason why we can face adversity. Uh, but people come up to me and they go, man, my, my world's a mess. My world is a mess. I mean, I feel like this is coming at me. This is coming at me. This is coming at me. And you know what the natural reaction, when things are coming at you from all these different directions, you know what people like to do? They like to move. They like to go, oh, I better do something. I better do something. I better do something. better. And when the world is moving around you, the last thing you want to do is move around and try to counter it. It's like, you know, we have a fault line here in New York State. I remember one time I was speaking in um, uh, Pencil Warren, Pennsylvania, a, a few summers ago. Remember there was like a tremor in New York? We felt it here. You know, we actually have a fault line here. But if there's a tremor or an earthquake and it's shaking, you know, what do you do? You don't go... You, you can't even walk anywhere. What do you do? You try to find solid ground and you stick to it. If this is the solid ground. The Bible is the only solid ground. It's the only solid ground. There's nothing else. I don't mean to be judgmental, but I do mean to be narrow-minded. I'm extremely narrow-minded on certain things. Abraham Lincoln was not just a, he certainly was not a thankless person. He wasn't just thankful. He was a thanksgiving man. You know, there's a reason why on President's Day we always think of Washington and Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln made one of the most courageous decisions that was ever made in the history of our country. America gets beaten up for slavery, and rightly so. It's morally wrong. It was never right. I don't care what any ill-informed person says. The Bible never condones slavery. Never. The few times Paul talks about it, he acknowledges it as a reality he can't change. The Bible never condones slavery. Never. But not only does the United States deserve that condemnation, so does most of the world. Most of the world believed in slavery. Why do you think there were colonies in all this? You know, America gets beat up for it. You know why America gets beat up for it? Because as very imperfect as our country is, at least we acknowledge our flaws. Not like most of these countries. They come begging us for money and they treat us like garbage. You know, we acknowledge our flaws. And that's what I love about America. We will always be flawed. Until Jesus Christ comes back, we are going to be flawed. But we acknowledge it. But Abraham Lincoln made the most critical decision when he declared that slavery was illegal or wanted to work toward it, and that led to the civil war in our country. And why it was such a big decision, number one, think about the economics. Basically, cheap or free labor. And there are a lot of people that benefited it in industry from it. They didn't want it. It took a lot of courage. But more than that, the thing that hurt Abraham Lincoln and made it difficult was to make a decision that he knew would divide our country. He, if you read about Lincoln, he never wanted our country to be divided. But he knew, like if your arm breaks and it starts to heal in an imperfect way, what do you got to do? You, what, you, what do you got to do? You got to break it and set it right. And he had to break the union so that it could be set right so that we can see all people as equally bearing the image of God. And he courageously led that effort. Where did he get the perspective to see all human beings with equal dignity and value before a living God? The Bible. He prayed regularly. In fact, um, I didn't 
necessarily see it, but a number of years ago, I spoke at Charles, Whitaker Church, Charles Whitaker's church. He spoke here a couple times. Uh, he's in um, the D.C., Maryland area, and, we, and, he, and he and his wife, Cheryl, uh, took Sue and I to George Washington's um, mansion, and um, I didn't see it, but next to his bed, they still have the kneeling, the kneeling, um, I don't know, something like when you pray a long time. He would pray sometimes for two hours at night. That the prayer kneel, not, not so much like the Roman Catholic Church, but like things that would hold your knees, and he would pray there, and so did Lincoln. And they did that because they believed God's word. Do you? Where else are you going to get the truth? Where would you get the truth if it wasn't for the Bible? See, the thing about the Bible is if I'm wrong, you get to tell me. And I don't get to go, no, I'm right because I'm right, because I'm a pastor. That's nonsense. The great thing is you don't get to let anybody trick you because you can have the Bible too. It's one of the great reasons why last month we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. We remember that the Bible is to be in everybody's hands. And it's the only source of truth. It's true north. And when you give thanks for the faithfulness of God's word, here's something you can say. Here's the second thing. Only God is this faithful. Only God is this faithful. Here's the third reason to give thanks. And it's this. Give thanks for the wonder of God's works. Look at what David says in this third section, verse 12 and then 23 to 26. He says, think of the wonderful works he has done. Think about it. The miracles, the judgments he handed down. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he has done. See that? See the, ref- the constant theme? Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He's to be revered above all gods. The gods of other nations are merely idols. But the Lord made the heavens. And that, was, that last statement says, these idols claim to do this or that. When God makes the heavens, that's game, set, match. It's all over. He created everything. Now David lists five great acts of God that he gives thanks for. First, his wonderful works, that is his good work in us, individually, and in our world. Second, for his miracles, his supernatural turning around of events for help. Third, his judgments, he says, his perfect decision-making and all that happens. You know, every time something happens in your life, God has a perfect reason for it. And fourth, his amazing things, his excellent working of events to fit together into a pattern of good. And then the makings of the heavens, that's crowning achievement, his creative work. When we pause to think of all that God's done for us, we have a cause to give thanks for his good works, the wonder of his works. Have you recounted all the ways that God has done wonderful things in your life? Do you remember that time when your car wouldn't start and you prayed like crazy, started making goofy promises of what you're going to do, and then your car starts and then you forget? I I can't, more than once have I prayed and my car wouldn't turn over, and it turned over. I was um, surfing the internet, and I was looking at some, uh, listening to some music, and some um, click. You know what clickbait is? It's like ten ways to be a billionaire, a quadrillionaire, and all. So I clicked on this clickbait. It said um, the ten things all successful people do, and they had a short video that had three of them. One of them was, oh. All successful people don't have a to-do list. I go, I, I do. I'm, how many have a to-do list? Yeah, like, if you're married, guys, you just... <laughs> I believe in a to-do list. I mean, mine are crazy. I have scraps of paper here, their pockets. I don't have this formal thing. But I'm going to ask you, I'm making this commitment, okay? I want to ask you to have another list. Along with your to-do list, I want you to have a God did list. A God did list. Here's how it works. Whether it's your iPad note feature or your cell phone or scraps of paper or a journal or a notebook, just dedicate a bunch of pages. And every time you think of something, my grandson's adorable. God gave me Brandon. Look at this incredible house I have. God gave me my house. And just make a God did list. 
And why do you do that? To remember the great works of God in your life. So you stop counting all your blessings on your fingers and all your problems on a calculator. Or as my son used to say, calculator. Be able to say, here's the third thing, only God can do that. Not luck, not this one or that one. Here's the fourth and final thing. Give thanks for the opportunity to praise him. Now David ends on an interesting note. Look at what I just said. Give thanks for the opportunity to give thanks. That's what David does. Look at verses 28 to 29. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come to worship him. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. First thing he does is recognize. Now listen to this. David is thankful. David gives thanks for the opportunity to give thanks to God. He gives thanks for the chance to give thanks to God. You know that a lot of people in our world can't. You know, in China, you can't give thanks to God very publicly. China, we learned this at Common Ground, two Common Grounds ago. We're not meeting this Thursday, but next Thursday, the first and second Thursday in December, by the way, not first and third. We wanted to push the second one up to the second week, second Thursday, because of Christmas. But we learned there that the church is growing like crazy in China. You know where else it's growing like crazy? You're not going to believe this. Iran. It, the church is growing in Iran. Now, you don't go public with this, do you? Because you'll be killed. It's an underground church. And here's what I'm saying. We need to give thanks that we can give thanks to God publicly. You know? Listen, I'm guilty of this, and so are you. You come into church late, because who cares, right? I'm just saying. So that you can come in 10 after, I'm just saying. And then you come, and you don't listen to the music. Then my message comes up. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, if you're lacking on sleep, I'll hook you up. Nine, about 9.30 and 11.30, I'll hook you up. I'll heal you. You don't need the CPAP, nothing. Just listen to me. And I'm just saying, and then the offering comes and we go, well, yeah, yeah, well, talk, talk, talk. Listen, I'm guilty of that too. I'm guilty of all that, sadly. But he recognized. Second, he gives. David realizes thanks and giving always go together. That's why thankfulness is not enough. Thanksgiving. And then third, he says, bring. David says, our God is so overwhelming, I must give my offerings to him as an act of worship. David saw giving his finances generously to God as a reflection of how much he worships him. And I'm telling you, you can tell me how much you love Jesus Christ. You go, oh, I love him, baby. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> and I just, I, I, honestly, you know, I'm not asking for it literally, but I, 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 just let me look at your checkbook. There's the answer. Don't, don't tell me how much you love him. Show me. And be able to, <laughs> you like that, Eloise? <laughs> listen, if Eloise says it's all right, listen to me. It is all right. You got it? <laughs> Eloise is wonderful. Thank you, Eloise. You're a blessing. Be able to say this, only God deserves my all. Only God deserves my all. Listen, you all deserve something of me, but you don't deserve everything of me. Only the Lord does. So you give thanks to God today. Will you give him thanks for the greatness of his character, the faithfulness of his word, the wonder of his works, and the opportunity to praise him? Will you? We have so much to give thanks to God for. So how do you plan on giving thanks to God through making waves? I don't want to detract, and this wasn't all one big commercial, but I, I have to insert here that we have a tremendous opportunity to give thanks for all the blessings we have through making waves 2018. You got all the mechanics from Dave Ray, and we'll help you. But by the end of the year, it's a dream. I don't want to say it probably won't happen. I don't want to have negative thoughts, but I'd love to see 100% of our church give something to help the 200,000 meals that we packed that cost us, which we still, haven't, we still have to raise the $44,000 for, or the way we'll help Nicaragua, the second poorest country, because we, we can't afford it from our general budget, can't. Look at the back of our program. We can't even meet our general budget as of today. We're behind. 
and so many other projects. So all I want to say is that if you really want to give thanks to God, here's your opportunity up front this year and then monthly next year. And here's the thing. I would love it to be 100%. Let me end with this. The best way to practice thanksgiving is through thanks living. Thanksgiving through thanks living. Pastor Jack Hinton um, went on a short-term mission trip to the island of Tobago. I don't know if it's Tobago or Tobago. Tobago? Yeah, that's what I thought. And um, he was involved in leading some singing time. The whole time there was one woman who had her back turned to him. And when he called for a request, the woman turned around and he said, in all humility, it was the most hideous face I'd ever seen in my life. Her nose had been completely consumed by leprosy because they were in a leper colony in Tobago. Ears completely gone as well. And she raised her hand for a request and she had nothing but stubs for fingers. And you know what she said? She said, I'd like to request, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. And if we bow our heads for just a moment, I want to ask you, wow, can you be like this woman and find something to give thanks to God for? It doesn't take much. But if somebody had a tough way, this was the woman, and she found it. Will you give thanks to God? How will you give thanks to God? You don't get to give him thanks in part of your life. You give him thanks from the totality of your being, from everything. And if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, you can do it right now and say, God, the reason why I haven't given you thanks is because I don't have a relationship with you. I am not yet a Christian, but I want to be now. Jesus, I believe you were born on Christmas. I believe you died on Good Friday. I believe you rose on Easter, and you are my only payment for my sin, the only thing that can do something about my sin. Jesus, with everything that I have, I yield my complete trust that what you did on the cross and in the grave paid for everything. And if you say it and mean it by faith alone, man, welcome to the family of God. Father, do a great work in them. Do a great work in all of us to give thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a great rest of the afternoon.